Greatest love song, the greatest story, the King of Heaven poured into a man. So helpless sinners can't find forgiveness, born for our salvation, God's redemption plan. The curse of i 
He is risen. He is risen indeed. Good morning and welcome to Country Hills Church. Happy Easter. We are so glad that you could join us this morning, whether you're in person with us or you're online and you're watching right now or a little bit later today. Um, whether you're a regular member of ours or a first time visitor, we're delighted to have you in celebrating. And we just wanna make sure that if you brought your kids, just make sure that you check them in if they wanna go downstairs or if they're staying with you with in the sermon. Our mission here is simple, but it's powerful. It's all about people helping people follow Jesus, and Easter is a great way for us to get that connected and started with that. Okay, so some exciting news after the service today. Please stay. Please stay for a time of fellowship, for friendship, and um, there is going to be some delicious coffee Tim Hortons has nothing on this coffee. So make sure you stay, check it out. And then we also have, um, oh, some really tasty hot cross buns. So yes, be sure to stay and let's just visit with one another and um, yeah, just enjoy. So one of the great things about Country Hills is you can get connected. One of the main ways to do that is following us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, following our YouTube channel and watching previous sermons and also signing up for our weekly emails because that's how you know about what's going on. So getting connected with us is really easy. You can sign up for our newsletter on our website by hitting the Get Connected button or filling out a connection card located at the Welcome Center. We also have two distinct newsletters, one for families with children so that you know what's going on with your kids and what they're learning downstairs or if they're part of our youth program. And there's also a church-wide event newsletter to ensure that you're never missing out on what's happening within our church and what's going on in upcoming weeks. Okay, is there anyone here that just kind of wishes sometimes they knew how to slow down and maybe have more of a spiritual connection? Yeah, couple, okay, yeah, thanks. So as of April 9th, let me just make sure, from uh, 7 to 9 p.m., the church is going to have what's called the uh, Emotionally Healthy Spiritual, spiri sorry, Spirituality Chorus. So please sign up, learn about this. Um, there's, there, it's going to explore eight biblical themes and will move you through a deeply change, oh my word, I'm so sorry. I think it's just a great opportunity to just come out. <laughs> Guys, I'm seriously getting older. Like, I didn't realize. I can't read. Anyways, the small type. It's going to sign up. Come out Tuesday. Spiritually healthy. You need that in order to emotionally healthy to be spiritually healthy. Okay? So, there you go. We also have a very exciting announcement that baby Isaac was born on March 28th for Ryan and Krista. So just very exciting for them that he could be born and safe. And if you just want to check the screen for upcoming events that are to come with Country Hills. Why are we here? We are here to slow down and remind ourselves that Easter is more than chocolates, traditions, baskets and eggs, celebrating, then forgetting. We are here to remember that Easter starts with our choice in the garden in a world drowning in sin, but does not end with a betrayal and a crucifixion. We are here to remember that Easter ends with an empty tomb and death defeated. We are here because a king who bought us at an unspeakable price was beaten and killed to become the sacrifice for our sin. We are here because Jesus loves us and is offering redemption for everyone. That's why we remember. That's why we celebrate. That's why we are here. Would you stand with us today? I can't. 
cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree.
sovereign. Praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. Oh, praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody. I'll praise. I'll praise cause you're sovereign. Praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. today because Jesus rose. We have victory in him and today we have confidence in him and I encourage you to lift your voice to him. There is nothing more that the Lord asks than worship and love.
darkness rejoiced, heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom and Yeah. 
church. You turn bones into arms. He's great and mighty. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. And for that today, Lord, we praise you. We love you, we honor you, and Lord, we come before you humbly, and we say thank you. We thank you for so much for dying, for rising, for being born, for living, for taking all of our things. Lord, help us give them to you. Lord, for those of us who are here who just so desire to be in your presence, Lord, help us love you so deeply and lord for those of you for those of us who are not here in a place where we want to be here lord i ask that you would open their hearts to you we come before you as a church loving you lifting you up in freedom and in truth we come before you as a family as people who are broken and we thank you amen you may be seated They stripped him and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and led him away to crucify him. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. From the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land. Jesus cried out, My God, my God! Why have you forsaken me? About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. His body was placed in a tomb, cut out of the rock. At dawn on Sunday, the women went to see the tomb. An angel of the Lord had descended from heaven and rolled back the stone. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. Let's pray together. Our God, this morning as we come to you, he is risen. He is risen indeed. And God, this morning as we come, that makes all the difference in our lives today and in our lives in the future. He is risen resonates with us because it means that Christ has conquered death. The plan of salvation is completed. We are able to come to you now and even speak like this because of the risen Savior. So we praise you this morning, God. We thank you that Jesus is alive. We thank you that he lives within our hearts this morning. That we don't follow just stories, but that we follow reality. The reality of a Savior who has been resurrected and who lives today. And so God, as we come this morning, we come with that thankfulness in our hearts. Because we know that he's alive. We thank you for your spirit now that lives within us. And convicts us and convinces us of the truth of that reality. And God, this morning as we come... 
We know that while we celebrate with joy, we can do so because of what you've done. We know that there are some here today who don't know you, who haven't experienced that reality of, of the risen Savior in their own lives. And we pray, God, as we worship together and as we hear your word, that you would convict us where we need convicting, that we would come to you, we would come back to you, and we would be restored to that relationship with you that you want us to have, God. We ask, God, this morning that you would be glorified in all that we do. We thank you again, God, that we are here together, that your spirit is among us, and that you're alive today. And so our hope is not just for today and living a good life today, but it's for a future eternal hope as well, because Christ has risen. And he's now seated at the right hand of, of our Father, and, and he's, he's, he's advocating on our behalf. So, God, this morning, we thank you for that. And Lord, I know this morning as we come with thankfulness on, this, on celebrating the risen Christ, I know that there are some who come here today with heavy hearts. There are relationships on their mind. There is maybe illness on their mind. There are financial burdens. There are other sorrows that they carry. And God, I pray that they would come to you this morning and leave them at your feet. Because we know that because Christ has risen, nothing is impossible with you and that you want to work in our lives today. And so I pray that all who, who are here today, who are listening, who are watching, would find in you the hope, the peace that comes in knowing you, and that those burdens, even for this time, would be lifted, and you would work in those situations your good will and your good purpose. God, I thank you for, for our children, and as we dismiss them in a moment, I just pray that you would bless their time downstairs. I thank you as well, God, for, for all the good things that you give us. And as we have given back to you with our time and with our offerings, our financial gifts, we ask that you would use them for the furtherance of your kingdom. And now, God, as Pastor Jeremy comes in just a few moments, we ask that you would anoint him, that his words would be your words, and that, you, it would, that the, the seed of your word would fall on good soil in our hearts, that it would, it would bloom and grow fruit. God, we worship you today. We thank you. You are an amazing God and this plan of salvation that came to fruition on the resurrection of Christ. We pray that we might share it with others. We might not keep it to ourselves, but we as a church and individuals might spread that good news to others, that others may find the joy and the peace that comes in knowing you and having our, a right relationship with you. So now, God, we just give you the rest of this service. We, we just pray that you would work and that you would be glorified, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, all the, the children up to grade six can be dismissed. We do have a nursery. We also have a toddler uh, room as well. And I would remind parents, if, they, if you haven't registered your children yet, please do so. Welcome uh, this Easter Sunday to Country House Church. For those of you uh, gathered in person and those of you online, thanks so much for joining us uh, today. There's this tradition, I don't know how many years old it is. Um, I used to hate it, but it shows I'm getting older because I like it now. So uh, we do something where uh, a person up front would say, he is risen, and the other people say, he is risen indeed. So let's try that. He is risen some of you have heard that before. Maybe not. I don't know. Listen, you may not know much about uh, me, uh, but I have really bad eyes. So I have terrible eyes. When I was born, I had all sorts of eye problems. And eventually they got to surgery after surgery to correct things and to correct the turned in eye and they discovered cataracts. And while they continued to fix those things externally, what came out or what became evident was that there were some problems inside, and some of you are going, yeah, I knew he had problems with his head, right? So though my left eye can be corrected to have 20-20 vision, it doesn't pick up the detail. It doesn't perceive things properly. So when I was in grade two, I wore a patch over my right eye, tried to force my brain uh, to, to learn and pick up detail and, 
and I can see things, but it's just not quick enough. It doesn't pick up on things. If I'm given enough time, I can do it. So give you an idea of what that's like. Um, I cheat sometimes on my eye exams if, if it's not an important one because I know the E and the A and the S, and I know all those things, right? But if I, if I just have my glasses on and I'm looking just with my left eye, I have to really concentrate if I don't know what it is. And it has to take shape, and eventually I can sometimes figure out what it is. And the problem is not that I can't see. It's a problem with perception. Now, you probably don't have the same eyes as me, but we all have the same thing happen to us. I'll guarantee it. Here's what it looks like. You see someone you kind of know, right? You recognize their face, but it's out of context. And so they know you, and they're talking to you, and they're using your name, and you're befuddled and mumbling through the conversation the whole time, what are you trying to do? You're trying to figure out, first of all, where do I know this person? And if I can put that together, then I can guess their name. And it's thanks, good to see you, see again sometime soon, right? The whole conversation, you see them, but you don't perceive them for who they truly are. And I think that's a lot like how some of us engage with Easter and the resurrection, Some of us have been in church a long time, and we've seen and heard the story, the narrative of resurrection. It's a pretty unbelievable thing, and though we see it, we hear it, we don't perceive it as a reality, and we don't perceive Jesus as he is. Some of you, this is not familiar, and this is new, and so you're seeing and have the choice to perceive all at the same time. But the end result of it all is a choice of whether we believe it's true or not. And that's what resurrection is all about. Now, we're going to read from uh, the Gospel of John. At the beginning of the New Testament, there's these four books called Gospels. It means good news. It, it's accounts of Jesus' life. And they're written by different people for different reasons with different points of focus. And John is the final one that, in the order that it's been set. There's no set order. It doesn't matter. But John is the one you'll find fourth. And in fact, John is probably the one who wrote his account last because he doesn't include some of the details that the others include together. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they include a lot of similar things. And John includes some different things and a different focus. And it's thought that possibly he's just trying to round things out. Now, why is that important? Because John knew Jesus personally. Okay, John was one of the first disciples chosen by Jesus. And he spent three to three and a half years with Jesus. In fact, throughout the book of John, the Gospel of John, you read this phrase, the disciple that Jesus loved. And at the end of John, it's revealed that he's writing about himself. He's so humble, he's not like the disciple Jesus only loved. John didn't want to put his name in there because he he was humble and he didn't want him to rise above the status or, or the picture of Jesus. And so John has this very personal view of Jesus. And one of the focus that he has in the book of John, in his gospel, his account of life of Jesus, was to help us see that Jesus is not just a good teacher, not just a man, but that he is in fact divine, God himself. And at the very end or towards the very end of this account, he gives a personal um, story about he, how he came to believe that Jesus was risen. And he didn't need to meet Jesus. He simply needed to see an empty tomb. And at that moment, all the teaching of Jesus, where Jesus said, I'll I'll be uh, arrested and given away uh, into, into others' hands, betrayed. I'll be crucified, dead and buried three days, and I'll rise again. He did it sometimes cryptically, sometimes very directly. He put it all together. And in that moment, he believed. And John 20 and 21. Now, there's no chapters when they wrote it. John wasn't like, here's verse 1 and verse 2. He's just writing an account. And we put the chapters and verses in so it's easier for us to find what we're looking for. And in John chapter 20 and 21, John gives four resurrection appearances of Jesus. In fact, John gives twice as many as the rest of the Gospels. John's Gospel can be called the Resurrection Gospel. And though John believes without having to see Jesus, he just believes the evidence and he's convinced. Some of you are like that. 
Like, you, you don't need to see a lot of evidence. You just, you just know somehow in your heart, you put it together and you believe. John chapter 20 and 21 are for the rest of us. Those of us who have a, a little more difficult time believing, and we're going to look primarily at Mary. Because John chapter 20 starts with Mary, and Mary's the first one to see Jesus. And if we're going to understand uh, what's happening here, we've got to understand who Mary is. So Mary, you might know her if you uh, are familiar with the Bible at all, or maybe even not. You might have heard her name, Mary Magdalene. Mary's called Mary Magdalene because she comes from this village up in Galilee, the province of, or the region of Galilee where Jesus grew up, and Nazareth is the town he's from. The town she's from is called Magdala, so she's known as Mary Magdalene, and she's an early follower of Jesus, and she meets Jesus in a remarkable way, and it's recorded in several Gospels that she's released from demon possession, not just, um, you know, some mental health issues or something. It says that she had seven evil spirits in her, and that Jesus released her from that. So to give you context of what that would have been like for her, uh, her whole life was ruined. She couldn't function. She couldn't think. She was under uh, the captivity of complete and utter darkness, not able to do anything for herself. If you're not into all the spiritual stuff, you don't believe in spiritual realms, you know, then just consider her having a, a degree of mental illness and mental health issues to the degree that she would have been institutionalized such that she couldn't do anything herself. That's how bad it would have been. And she meets Jesus, and he releases her from that. He heals her from that. And so it's not surprising that she spends the next few years of her life following Jesus. And we find her in all four Gospels, and she comes in and out of the story at different times. And we find her at the foot of the cross as one of the women who are there. And we find that uh, at least for sure when Jesus is in and around Galilee, that she's one of the women who supports him and helps the ministry. So in order that Jesus and the disciples don't have to work, you know, side hustles to make things work, uh, there were those who supported and so that she's one of the supporters. And, and, and if you had been released from death to life in that way, from complete oppression and inability to live to freedom, you probably would have done that too. She's also one of the women who help with Jesus' body. When he dies, helps take him off the cross and begins to prepare his body. Now, that happens on a Friday. And that's... Uh, Sabbath is coming in the evening. Sabbath is a time for the Jewish people where they do no work. And in order to celebrate uh, Sabbath or to take part in, in church, synagogue, they had to be ceremonially clean. So they couldn't touch dead bodies. So there's that time crunch running against those who are preparing the body of Jesus. They have to get it done quick so they can celebrate Sabbath. In addition to that, it's Passover. So people from all over Israel have come to Jerusalem to celebrate this incredibly important festival, this religious celebration called Passover. It was really important. You didn't miss out on this, and they just didn't have enough time in their culture to prepare Jesus' body the way that they would have. So just like whatever culture you're from, there are certain things that go along with death, certain traditions you have in order to mourn and grieve and get some closure. And they had the same thing. But they weren't able to do that in time. And so Mary would have handled the dead body of Jesus. She, she would have helped wrap him and put spices on him. And eventually time was running out. And they put his body in a tomb nearby to where he was crucified in a garden. Owned by one of the other followers who are there with her and the others. And so she is incredibly distraught, obviously, She's given her whole life to Jesus. She believes he is who he said he was because her Jewish scriptures said that there would be one who would come who would be a better king than their favorite king, King David. They were under Roman occupation. So the Romans, this is at the height of the Roman Empire, took over Israel, and known as Judea. And so the Jewish people had some religious freedoms, but they had no political freedoms. And so people were looking for this Messiah, this promised one, this anointed one, the Christ, to come. They're looking for who that might be. And Jesus claims to be that. And the fact that he releases Mary from this demon possession and does all these other things in her life and others' life, she believes he's the one. And at the height of Passover, uh, as they're heading 
into the Passover celebration, he's betrayed and he's taken away. And she watches as he's on trial and as he's tortured and beaten and crucified. And eventually she helps take his lifeless body off the cross. And she helps prepare the body quickly, stealing him away into a tomb so that once Sabbath is done, once this Passover Sabbath is done on Sunday morning, she can come and finish what she's doing. And that's exactly where we find her at the beginning of John chapter 20. She's likely got spices and materials in hand. It's dark, it's early morning, and she heads to the tomb. John chapter 20, if you don't have a Bible, no problem. It's up on the screen, or if you have the Bible app, you can look it up in there. John chapter 20, early on Sunday morning, when it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter. So here's one of the other key disciples. Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved. Who's that? John. John, right? So uh, she said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So she arrives. She sees a stone rolled away. They would have put a stone in front so that Jesus' body wouldn't be tampered with. But the Romans put it there and the Jewish religious leaders put it there because they know that Jesus predicted that he would rise from the dead. And they didn't want the disciples faking this. So they posted guards. They put a big stone there. Uh, In another gospel account, the the women, as they're arriving, they don't don't know what they're going to do with this stone. How are they going to roll it away? And she arrives, and the stone's rolled away, and she doesn't have the wherewithal to look in. Maybe you would be too. Maybe it's because she was a woman, alone, early morning, uh, possibly some other women around her, but they don't look in. And so she goes back and finds Peter, and John, likely the unofficial leaders along with James, John's brother of the 12 disciples. And they would eventually kind of take leadership roles after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. And she finds them and says, I got there and his body's gone. I I don't know what they've done with him. And we pick up the narrative in verse 3. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, wouldn't you too? They're running. They just take it. They don't even wait for Mary. They just take off running. But the other disciple outran Peter. So John outruns Peter and reaches the tomb first. He stopped. John stopped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings there. So think of a mummy. That's what they would have done. They wrapped the body in one and the head in another. But he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrives. So John gets there first. He's faster. Peter's slower. Peter gets there. But Peter actually goes in and doesn't just look. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noted the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first, John, also went in and he saw and believed. He saw these things. Why did he believe? Verse 9, for until then they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. So in that moment, it all comes together. And he realizes the prophecies about the Christ, the Messiah, who Jesus is, rising from the dead. And what Jesus said he'd do, it comes together and he believes. And they go home. They go back. I'm sure they're still going home like, I believe, but I'm like, I don't know. What do we do? Well, where's Mary in all this? Well, we pick that back up in verse 11. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stooped and looked in. Now, when you first read this, you're thinking, hold on, John and Peter. Why would you leave Mary crying and just go back home? But you can ask the same thing, Mary, why wouldn't you just like look in and check these things out? When we're in an uncertain situation, when we're at the depth of grief, we really can't be held accountable for our, our, our reactions. And so, Uh, John and Peter head home. Mary had come on her own, so maybe they left her in her independence to finish whatever she was going to do or figure out what she was going to do. And so I don't think we need to take this as an act of insensitivity. We just need to understand how grief-stricken they were and how, like, just uncertain. Their whole world had come crashing down. Just a few days earlier when Jesus died, they took him off the cross, and now he's either missing or he's risen from the dead, which is a pretty unbelievable thing. Verse 12, she saw two white-robed angels. 
one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken my, uh, away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they've put him. Now, typically in Scripture, angels are not wings and halos. In fact, halo is kind of a made-up thing because they glow. Sometimes there's like a radiance to angels. But the most common picture of, scripture, uh, of angels in Scripture is men. And sometimes they're recognized as angels and sometimes not. Sometimes they have like a radiance about them. Sometimes they're recognized right away. Sometimes they cause great fear. And sometimes not, depending on the message and what's going on. And Mary doesn't perceive that they're angels at all. She just thinks since she hasn't looked in the tomb and Peter and John have, maybe they were there with Peter and John, and she does what any of us would do. She's crying. And, and, and the men say, why are you crying? And she just says, well, they've taken my Lord. Can you, can you tell me where he is? She's looking for any clues possible. And without an answer, verse 14, she turned to leave. And saw someone else standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. I would add either. Didn't recognize the angel. She didn't recognize Jesus. And Jesus asked the same question the angels do in verse 15 here. Dear woman, why are you crying? And then he probes a little deeper. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? And so she sees Jesus, but she doesn't perceive him. She sees the angels. She doesn't perceive them. She's not quite sure what's going on, and she's just trying to get some information. John believes he's risen from the dead. Mary's not there yet. We continue in verse 15. She thought it was the gardener. The tomb was in a gardener, uh, in a garden. It would make sense. The gardener would be there, and she simply says, sir, if you have taken him away, figuring he might have been there or had some hand in it, he might have some info, please tell me where you've put him, and I'll go get him. She just, she just doesn't see that it's Jesus. We don't know if this is a, a spiritual thing. We don't know if this is part of grief. We don't know what's happening exactly, but she sees the gardener. She doesn't perceive him as Jesus until, verse 16, he speaks her name. Mary, Jesus said. She turned him and cried out, Rabboni, which means teacher in Hebrew. And so Mary doesn't perceive him until she hears him call her name. And that's the way it is with all of us. That's the way Jesus calls us. If Jesus is who he said he is, and if he rose from the dead and he's alive and has ascended to the heavenly realm and we're waiting for his second return to bring the renewal of all things, to resurrect his followers and the earth back to the way it should be, get rid of sin and evil and all that stuff, then he's speaking still. And the question for us today is, if we were to hear his voice, would we recognize it? His voice won't come audibly, we won't see him outside, we won't confuse him for a gardener, but he calls our name, he speaks our name. If Jesus is who he says he is, that means he's part of the Trinity who created us. He has a hand in designing us. He knows us by name. In fact, he knows everything about us. And when he says Mary, she recognized because she'd heard him say her name before. Maybe it's kind of like what he said to her after he released her from bondage to evil, called her out of the darkness into light. Mary, Rabboni, which means teacher. Verse 17, don't cling to me, Jesus says. Sounds like a harsh statement, doesn't it? Don't cling to me. But there's something to that. He's saying, look, don't hold on, to, hold on to who I was. And also, there's some stuff to do. Don't stay here. For I haven't yet ascended to the Father, so he would ascend to the Father. But go and find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them his message. So he says, don't cling to me. Look, don't cling to who I was. There's something for you to do. Mary, I've called you. I've got something for you to do. I know who you are. I'm risen. I'm alive. I'm with you. And I'll go with you. Here's what I want you to do next. So John sees an empty tomb and he believes. 
With Mary, it took an experience with the risen Jesus for her to believe, but all she needed was to hear him call her name personally. And I think the rest of John 20 and 21 looks at three groups of people who don't see and believe right away. Because it's normal and it's natural with something like someone coming back from the dead. Uh, having scriptures written that they'll do that. Prophecies hundreds of years before. And then to say it out loud and then to do it. That is an unbelievable thing. So while John, he sees and he believes, the rest of us have a hard time perceiving. And I think there's three groups of people as we look at Jesus' appearances that it makes sense that might be in the room today or watching online. There are those of you like Mary who need to experience Jesus. There are those of you who may need some evidence, and there are those of you who may feel estranged from Jesus, uh, too distant to even know if you will get your name called or if you can believe or not. Let's talk about experience. Mary didn't believe like John. She needed an experience with Jesus. And because Jesus is alive and working in the world, you can experience him today. He calls your name. The way we come to faith to believe in Jesus is that God works in our spirit, in our heart, in our inner being. And we feel promptings and we hear his voice. That would be the category I'm in. And I experience risen Jesus every day. I speak to him. I hear from him. He speaks to me through the Bible, through prayer, through nature, through words, through conversation, through songs, through movies, through life, through others. He's speaking all the time. We went through a sermon series in fall about hearing God's voice, hearing him speak to us, experiencing Jesus. And if that's you, you're a little bit more emotive. You're looking for an experience with Jesus. I invite you to be open to that, to read the Bible, to reach out in prayer, to have times of silence and waiting, to pay attention to nature and look and see if you can reconcile how this all came together without someone who designed it and deeply loves you and wants you to experience him through what he's made. That's the first group. The second group are those who maybe need a little bit of evidence. And John goes from the Mary narrative, he jumps a little bit and shares how Jesus now appears to the disciples for the first time. They're behind closed doors, they've got it locked, they're afraid because the Jewish leaders are maybe out to get them too. And Jesus appears to them behind locked doors. He eats with them, he encourages them to receive and experience his peace, and then he departs from them. And, and they can't believe this. But one of the 12, named Thomas, isn't there. You might know him. You, you might not even be familiar with the Bible at all, but you know the phrase, doubting Thomas. This is where this comes from. Thomas isn't there with him. And so they go and find Thomas, and they say, you'll never believe it. You know how Jesus appeared to Mary? He appeared to us. We're behind locked doors. We ate with him. He said, peace be with you. And Thomas goes, I'm not sure about that. If I see Jesus for myself, I'll be able to perceive him if I touch his wounds, put my hand on his side. If I can touch him and talk to him, then I'll believe. You know, Thomas gets a really bad rap. Doubting is not unbelief. Doubting is really, really healthy. What doubting is is searching for good answers from good places. And the very next thing John records in, in John chapter 20 is he appears, Jesus appears to Mary, Jesus appears to the disciples, and eight full days later, he appears to the disciples again. This time, Thomas is with him, and Jesus cuts right to the chase. As soon as he's with them, he says, Thomas, come here. Touch my hands. Touch my side. Thomas has the most remarkable response to Jesus of anyone because he doesn't just simply say, Rabboni, teacher. I think that's part of why Jesus said, don't cling to me. Uh, perceive me as I am, not on who you knew me to be. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. He sees what John's trying to build to in his gospel, that Jesus is not a good teacher. He's not a good moral man. He's not a great guy who's kind to people. He's God himself. And Thomas knows that. Thomas just needs a little bit of evidence. And maybe that's you. And in a minute, I'm going to list some places where you can find some good evidence for yourself. Be careful where you look, because there's good places, there's not so good places to look. And I don't mean by not so good places, things that don't 
share things from my point of view. I just mean there's good information and there's bad information. But before we get to that, let's just move back to Mary for a minute. Because Mary has a part to play in this evidence group as well. Jesus' appearance to Mary would become one of the greatest evidences for the truth of the resurrection that we have today. Now, part of the reason the Jewish religious leaders put a big stone and put guards by the tomb was they didn't want the disciples to steal the body and make up a story. Why? Because it's what they would have done. And so once they hear that Jesus is not there, they start spreading a rumor. In fact, they start paying people off. These are like the temple religious leaders, good bunch of guys, right? They're paying people off to spread a story that the disciples stole the body, and now they're saying he's risen. We have to look at Scripture in its historical context. We can't read back into it our culture. We have to read it for what it's written for. And if John and James and and Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and all these people who are gathering these accounts of Jesus' life and putting it uh, together and spreading the story written and verbally, if they wanted to spread a falsehood, if they wanted to make up a story that Jesus had risen, there is no way they would have had a woman the first to see Jesus. Why? In Jewish culture, women were less than men. Not just treated less, they were less than men. Considered that. In a Jewish court of law, in order to have a testimony, you had to have the witness of two people. Two men only. Two men, and if their stories aligned, their witness was considered viable for evidence. In fact, when Jesus was on trial, they had such problem condemning him to death for the sin, the religious sin of blasphemy, claiming to be God, they had such a problem because they couldn't get two men who agreed on their story. Finally, they had some people who fabricated some things that matched, and they could do that, and Jesus spoke it himself. If a woman testified, well, I can't even say that. She wouldn't testify in court. Women weren't allowed to testify in court. Women were lesser beings than men. If you wanted to fabricate a story, there is no way you would have women at the tomb, one specific, Mary Magdalene, who was the first to see Jesus. If you wanted to fabricate it, you would do what the Jewish religious leaders did. They said the official word from the temple, from people of, of uh, position and power, was that Jesus' body was stolen by the disciples. That's how you do it. In fact, these 12 men, or I guess 11 by the time Judas is out of the picture, They didn't have standing. They they wouldn't be the ones. They would gather together the followers who have some sort of position in Jerusalem. They'd write it down. They'd have those people distribute it, and they would put some credibility behind the story. But none of that happens. Why? Because Jesus is truth, and his disciples speak truth, and so John is writing an account truthfully of what actually happened. Here's a few places you can look for evidence. It'll come pretty quickly on the screen. Here's a picture from our library, three books in there, Reason for God by Tim Keller, Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, and Evidence that Demands a Verdict. Those are great sources. This is the Prepare to Answer website. Scott Steen will be here in a month to preach. Great resource. Cross-examine with Dr. Frank Turek. That's another good place. Reasonable Faith with Dr. William Lane Craig. That's another good place. Uh, to look and finally give me an answer with Stuart and Cliff Nectel. They all have YouTube stuff, and this one's YouTube specific Red Pen Logic. And what he takes is clips off of TikTok that try and uh, speak against Christianity and its truth, and he debunks them. So you can find all of them have YouTube channels that, that Cliff and Stuart Nectel are really interesting because they go out into university campuses and just take questions and talk with people. The other ones are you know, doctors of philosophy or apologetics, in other words, explaining faith. They have great resources and books and videos and wonderful stuff on YouTube and TikTok. You can find good stuff there. So if you are looking for evidence and you are doubting and you see but you can't perceive, dig, search. Jesus isn't afraid of that. Like that's a good and a healthy thing. The final group jumps off of where we ended with Mary. It's those who feel like they're estranged. So that culture was not particularly kind to 
women, nor have most cultures, nor ours. But Jesus did something different. Jesus didn't treat women the way his culture prescribed. In fact, uh, just some of the evidence is from John's gospel. And you can look these up yourself. And if you're wondering about those resources, they flew by too quick. Just go back in the YouTube and look them up. Uh, John chapter 4 talks about his encounter with a Samaritan woman alone in the middle of the day. Not allowed for a Jewish man to do that. But he knew her heart and ministered to her. John chapter 8, Jesus gets in the middle of this uh, really a lynching kind of, of, a, of a sinful woman. And he advocates for her and rescues her. In John 19, there's women at the cross and the interaction between Jesus and these women is key and important. That's mentioned. The anointing of his feet, which we talked about a couple Sundays ago uh, by Mary. And account after account throughout the book of John and elsewhere where Jesus interacts with women and he listens to them and he cares for them and he heals them and he prays with them. And if we take that truth and expand it out, we see that Jesus did much more with many different groups of people who are not considered to be welcome, who are considered to be less than. Jesus elevated the status and treatment of many in his ministry, children, slaves, the sick, especially leprous or skin disease, which were highly contagious. And if you had those things, you'd be put outside the community with groups of others, had a bell around your neck. And if you came near, everyone stayed away. Jesus touched those people. He healed them. He ministered to them. He elevated the status of the poor, the hated, the outcast. In the New Testament letters after the Gospels, letters written of how do we be these people of Jesus' way? How do we be these Christians, meaning little Christs? How, how do we do this? All the rest of the letters. And it talks about how we learn to be in harmony with one another, a slave and a slave owner. How, 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 do, you, how do you do that? They, they may not have been able to completely undo this, the, the whole thing of slavery in that culture, but they can certainly teach people with the, the poor and the rich and, and the Gentiles, non-Jew, and the Jews, and the, and the male, and the, the female, and all these different groups of people who are considered in this hierarchy of better than, the whole playing field's leveled with Jesus. And if you feel estranged from the church community, maybe because of our behavior or something you've heard, let me welcome you back. Because no one's estranged from Jesus. Jesus welcomes everyone. Everyone has a place. Everyone has a home. Everyone's part of the family if they choose to perceive and believe. You can self-adopt yourself in just by simply believing. You don't have to have it all figured out. You just have to believe Jesus is who he said he is and begin the process of growth. We're people helping people follow Jesus because we don't have it figured out. And we never will. But Jesus does. And Jesus invites you if you need an experience with him. Just need him to call your name. That's, that's what he's there for. He's there for those who need evidence, who need to probe, who need to ask tough, good, excellent questions and get good answers. And he's there for those who feel estranged. I would never be welcome if I went in those places, if I went with those people. I've seen online, I've heard, I had an experience in my childhood. I have people in my life right now who say they follow Christ and they are jerks. If you feel estranged, Jesus invites you. And so my hope today is that may you see, perceive, and believe in Jesus. I'm indebted to a book I read this year called The Risen Existence. The Spirit of Easter by author Paula Gooder. And she talked about that seeing, perceiving. That's not mine. Put my own spin on it. But I'm indebted to her. I think it's such a wonderful illustration. Here's a quote of how she views crucifixion and resurrection in light of that. What in human sight was ignominious defeat was in divine sight glorious victory. What in human sight was an event of the utmost despair was in divine sight a moment of perfect joy, what in human sight was the end, was in divine sight the completion that brought forth a new beginning. Even if we see Jesus, we may not perceive him. Even if we perceive him, we may choose not to believe. And my hope is that you would see, perceive, 
and believe in Jesus because he's good. I think there's good evidence. I think you can experience him. And I think no matter how estranged you feel, this is supposed to be home. We're supposed to find a new way to be human, a new way to be family together. The promise of Jesus wasn't a new religion. When he said, I need to ascend, tell my brothers, it's because he was sending his spirit that God would be with us and in us and work in and through us. Not a religious system, not a system of being better, not trying to be more moral than the next person, but a system where we recognize that we can do nothing on our own to better ourselves or our world apart from Jesus who created it all. And as he transforms us from the inside out, makes us new and makes us more like who he created us to be, in that we can help one another. And as we do that, we bring restoration to people's lives and to the world. It's his plan. So if you don't hear his voice right now, be open to listen. If you don't have good evidence now, do some digging, ask some questions. And if you feel estranged, maybe you're watching from home because you're not sure about coming in with this crazy group of people, I invite you to just come a little closer and realize that Jesus loves you as you are. He welcomes you, but he loves you too much to leave you there. And so do we. And so we help one another follow Jesus. May you this Easter, this Resurrection Sunday, see, perceive, and believe in Jesus. Would you stand as we pray? God, thank you for sending your son, fully God, fully human, in our place. Thank you, Jesus, that you did not stay dead, that we don't look back on a martyr and a good moral system, but that you're alive and you're working. Father, we pray that as we go throughout the rest of this day, whatever it holds, with um, maybe it's with family, maybe it's on our own, we pray that you would continue to speak to our hearts. I ask that we would feel inner promptings and nudges to move a little closer to you. Lord, the reality is believing in you, Jesus, as alive and risen and ascended and being God and human and all this, it is unbelievable and it's really hard to believe. But thank you for... Um, your voice, calling us by name. Thank you that we can experience you apart from morality or church services or anything like that, just you and us. Thank you that we can find good evidence. And thank you that no matter how estranged we feel, you welcome all people and that we can find a home and a new way with you. We ask your blessing on this day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks so much for joining us. Hopefully you can stick around. And if you have kids, okay, please help them with the hot cross buns and the hot drinks. Usually it's a free for all, way too many people, okay? Stick around, have a wonderful Easter. Hope to see you again next week. Lord bless you as you go. to the passion that you have.